Hello, friends, and welcome. I'm your co-host, Andrew Lazaga, here with Dubside. And you're listening to the Dubcast with Dubside. Dubside's on tour in the Midwest, and he is reporting from Minneapolis. No, actually, I'm, I'm north of Minneapolis. I'm, I'm up near a town called Brainerd. Okay. Which is where, which is where they have the, the Minnesota, what's it called? The Minnesota Gathering. Traditional Paddlers Gathering is what they're calling it now. So that's in two weeks from right now. But uh, this coming weekend, I'll be going to the Apostle Islands. I'm doing some paddling there with some folks. And then the weekend after that is the Minnesota Gathering. Then I'll be back in the, the East Coast. So how's the paddling been out there? Well, well, I did Pitchard Rocks, which is another part of the Michigan shoreline and the up, Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And it's a very picturesque uh, tourist destination. But you can only you see it best from the water because of these unique formations and little cave thing kind of. And the way the the way the the rock dissolves the, with the I don't know, can't describe it. It's it's the they take postcard pictures there all the time. <laughs> so so they have they have they have tour boats that go out in there, and then there's kayak groups that go out there. And, and it goes on for several miles, too. They're like arches and caves out there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, arches. Yeah, you paddle through the arches. And then the, the guy, we went there with a guy who, who who's done a lot of stuff there and does, I think he teaches some of the guides there. And he was showing us the stuff that, that had changed over the year. Like he said, this part here fell down in, oh, yeah. like sometime in the past five years. And you see all the crumbling stuff there. And so, yeah, it is evolving. Cool. How's the weather? It was, uh, let's see, it was a little bit cooler than than August, you would think. But <laughs> <laughs> when it got warm, we had, we had some rain. We had, had a variety of things. And the wind died down enough at, for, for us to go out there. there. But at one point, it was quite windy. So we've had a, a variety of things. Did it rain a lot? Um, Some rain came through at some point. Yeah. But, you know, it got sunny again. Hmm, okay. Well... Kai and I had an amazing trip paddling around Desolation Sound. Uh-huh. This had actually been the first time I had been to Canada since before the pandemic. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh. So it was interesting to see how things have changed. Lots of people in kayaks, tour groups. There's a group of kids from a YMCA camp. Uh-huh. Some solo paddlers. Just beautiful campsites, amazing views. Uh-huh. We saw some humpback wheels just uh on the ferry ride over oh, yeah. from Powell river yeah mm. yeah there was one day when it where it just rained all day long when you have some showers it's like maybe an hour or so of, uh, of rain and it's not a big deal but when it rains all day long you know things start to get wet it doesn't take a lot of water for your sleeping bag to get wet and your tents yeah. to start leaking and stuff like that <laughs> But it was, I, it was I've, I've, I've been I've been on the trip like that that I can remember. We were we were at one spot for like three or four days, and it 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 was like nonstop rain. Oh wow! And and yeah. I my, my my nice tent that I thought was pretty cool. I figured out where it leaked. If you really get heavy rain, it comes down. So three or four day rain, days of rain. When I took the tent down at the last day, there were mushrooms growing in the vestibule. <laughs> that that's how what moist it was. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you lived in BC for a while, didn't you? I did. I did for. I was there for like a month or two. Oh, okay. way in the interior, way way up. up okay. Far, yeah. So you weren't doing a lot of sea kayaking then. No, no there were a few lakes. Now went out to there were not yeah. a whole lot of stuff. But then, the, the single trips we go out to like Vancouver Island, a place like that. But I lived. It was it, where I stayed for a few months. It was in the interior, and some of that was during the winter time. It never got to thirty below. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there's a lot to explore up there. I'd like to explore more, but um, yeah, you know, some of these areas require you to drive on poorly maintained gravel logging roads, sometimes mm-hmm. for two or three hours. Well, we went to Bamfield, which is on the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island, one time to go to uh, the Deer Group, and okay. that was like a two-hour uh, drive on a bumpy gravel road. Yeah. And for like, a whole year afterwards, I was still washing out dust out of the all the nooks really? and crannies of my car yeah yeah well, I, well i'm i'm i've been doing all these different things the past few weeks so i forget what i've done but i now I, it's, i'm coming it's coming back to me now okay we went we went through we drove from the michigan training camp which is near traverse city up north through through the upper peninsula and then crossed through that you know wisconsin and minnesota that way 
so the upper peninsula of Michigan is a very unique part of Michigan. The, the people, they call themselves Upers for UP, Upper Peninsula. Oh. So there's, they have a little tourist booklets, you know, how do you, how do you define, if, how do you know if you're a Uper or not, or what's a real Uper? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the coolest thing I found up there, they have this, the, the, the specialty food, it's called a, uh, what is it, a pasty. It's like a bread filled, it's like a big piece of bread with inside they've got their, their meat ones and their vegetable ones and you can get like chicken and meat or stuff or the vegetables so lots of potatoes carrots beans whatever in there and so the thing it's it's like the size of two or three hamburgers it's like a big thing oh wow and this this is traditionally it was like the the miners copper mines up here was a big deal way back when this was a thing you could you could pack for a whole meal in one one thing and eat that and uh, something something about you you could fit it on the end of a shovel to cook it or I forget what I didn't, I didn't read the, all the exact part but it's a it was makes a good meal I was enjoying mine. Wow, sounds great. What do you like to cook for um, camp food? Well, yeah, I'm gonna have to figure that out in the next couple of days. But if I <laughs> if I can do my usual thing, if I can get a pan or a, a a good sized saucepan and get the right produce ingredients and if i get a, a stove that'll simmer i'll make what i what i usually make the, uh, the full description of what the upside eats for breakfast every day is that what's coming up <laughs> excellent well i think that's a great place to segue into dubcast number 46 the dubside breakfast welcome to the dubcast with Dubside. This is Dubcast number 46. I'm going to talk about food. My kind of food. And I will have some music by my favorite group out of Greenland, Nanook. A song, one of their more recent works. Song called Namigitanek. Well, for most of this episode, I'm going to be talking about breakfast. So let me bring in some breakfast sounds. Imagine you are outside as the sun comes up and the birds start to sing. There we go. In 2007, I was invited to go to a kayak symposium in Spain. And in order to get there from where I was living in Seattle, I had to get up at about 3.30 in the morning to get to the Seattle airport and fly to New York City and then fly from there to Barcelona and I didn't sleep on the flight because I wasn't tired but when I got to Spain it was about 10 30 p.m. my time what my body was thinking about but the local time was 7 30 in the morning so they picked me up somebody came to the airport to pick me up and drove me to the train station it took a little while to get through downtown Barcelona to get to the station where we had to depart from. And they put me on a train to Yansa, which is the town up close to the French border where the symposium was to be held. And I didn't get to Yansa until about 11 a.m. in the morning. And somebody there came to pick me up and dropped me off at the site where the symposium was to be held. And this was... A Thursday, I, I left Wednesday morning, but it was now Thursday evening, but the symposium was a, a weekend thing, so there was nobody there. Uh, it, was, it was one of these uh, campsite areas on the water, on the Mediterranean, actually. And so I was going to be staying in, with some other people in this, they were calling it a bungalow, which is, it was too small to be called a cabin. It was very, very tight quarters. It was a little teeny little kitchen there and a little bitty bathroom and some bunks and things. 
But there was, the, nobody else was there yet. It was just me. So I was uh, looked in, the, in, the, in this bungalow. There was no there was no food in the in the cupboard or the refrigerator, and there wasn't any any soap in the in the bathroom. So I could only take a shower with water. And so I was waiting for somebody to come by and you know just provide me with some basic hospitality needs, but uh, nobody nobody came. And it got to be about midnight, and I was quite hungry, but there was nobody there. So having slept through the, the day, I was now awake, even though it was nighttime there, um, and I had to sort of sleep on and off or, or try to occupy the time until the morning came, and I would hope somebody would come and uh, hook me up. Now, I did not have any euros. I hadn't changed any money, so I had no money to go buy anything if, if even after the stores were open. So it wasn't until about 9.30 in the morning that somebody finally showed up. This guy, Jose, was one of the guys running the symposium, and he took me into town to some little restaurant, and I had, I think it was a fish sandwich, which tasted incredible because when you're that hungry, anything tastes incredible. So I, I tell you that to introduce the topic of what I typically eat for breakfast. And I've developed this particular thing over the course of several, several decades, actually. It's evolved over time. And so I'll, I'll describe the, the general idea, then, then go into more of the details of it. So and this is what I make every, every day, every morning when I'm, when I'm at home. So, starts with, uh, the basic idea is it's, it's rice and beans with a whole lot of vegetables on top that, that cook in one pan. It's like a single, single dish kind of meal. So, you start with a two-quart saucepan. I use a, a cast iron one with a nice solid cast iron lid. And then first goes in a third of a cup of short grain brown rice. And sometimes I use medium grain because it's a little cheaper. But long grain brown rice tastes not as good. Short grain brown rice is the best. Then I add some sort of beans. Could be chickpeas work very well, but that's chickpeas that have been soaked overnight. Otherwise, I'll use lentils if I haven't soaked any. But chickpeas or black beans, azuki beans, uh, black-eyed peas, something like that. And it doesn't take very much of them, just maybe the, uh, a layer on the, on the bottom of the, the cup that I'm going to soak them in, just a layer on the bottom. Doesn't, don't need a whole lot of beans, but that with a third of a cup of rice. And so then I will cut up a small onion or half of a larger onion, just dice it up. That goes in. Then I'll put in one unsulfured Turkish apricot. And the, sometimes I'll use the, the sulfured ones, but they don't taste nearly as good. The, the sulfured ones, there's the orangey ones, but the, the darker brownish, brown or orange things, are the unsulfured ones, and the ones from actually Turkish unsulfured apricots taste much, much better than the other ones. So one of those. Then I will cut up a mushroom. Could be a regular white mushroom or one of those baby bella make good mushrooms, something, something in the mushroom family. Then I will cut up a maybe half of or less of a beet, a red beet, diced it up, thrown in. And then a Brussels sprout, or the proper way to say it is Brussels sprout, a single one of those, uh, maybe cut in half if it's not too uh, small. Then I may put in a potato, a small, could be a, a baking potato or, or a regular boiling potato, either one. Um, dice that up, that goes in. Then a, some amount of squash. And this is the, not, not the soft summer squash, but the harder, like butternut or, or um, acorn squash. 
Um, and and you know, less 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 of that than the the amount of the the potato. So not the whole squash, but you know, without the seeds. And I, I do not take the skin off the squash. Just just with the skin on, dice that up in you know, chunks. Put that in there. And then on top of that goes um, kale, kale that's been chopped up fine. And that will often take me right up to the top of the pan. So that is brought to a boil. And then it's taken down to simmer. And it simmers for about 45 minutes. And then I take it off the burner and I put some olive oil on top just on, onto the kale it'll sink down lower not not too much olive oil and then i will take a piece of sharp cheddar cheese or i, I sometimes some other types of cheese but sh cheddar sharp cheddar makes a good good choice um, and so that goes on top after it's after it's done cooking and i will eat that with one raw carrot and for the beverage, I will drink water. And that is my breakfast every day. And I have the, the morning routine is worked out with that. So that the 45 minutes while it cooks, I'm either you know, doing exercises or, or practicing guitar or something. But that's, that's programmed into the morning. So it's not like I'm anxiously waiting for the breakfast to finish. I'm, I'm busy with doing something else. And then I eat that with one spoon right out of the pan, so I don't get any other dishes dirty to do that. And the cast iron pan is not washed, not in the sink, not in the dishwasher. It doesn't. I just put the lid back on it and put it back on the stove where it will be ready to be used the next morning when I do the whole thing over again. I used to call that the commando breakfast when I was promoting the commando kayaking, the folding kayaks on public transportation. But nowadays, I, it's just known as the dubside breakfast. What I told you was the basic version of it, but to give it some variety and so it doesn't get too boring, since it's the same thing I make every single day, there are variations on that idea. And these involve a whole different selection of vegetables and other ingredients that just change over time. So I can leave out the potato if I've got some more exotic stuff. And I will often put some seaweed in towards the beginning with the rice, just a little bit of maybe kelp. I will use um, dried corn that I get in the Peruvian section of a, of, of a market. It's that large kernels of, of corn that are often yellow. Sometimes they have blue ones, but the, the yellow ones, there's a couple different varieties of them, but it, it's only maybe five or six of those big kernels with each, with each time I make it, but just some of that is, provides a nice uh, addition. Sometimes I will use eggplant, some section of eggplant diced up, or maybe rutabaga. I will put garlic in there sometimes. I will often use ginger, cut it with just regular fresh ginger and chop it up in small little slivers and use that as a spice. And I, I've used to do curry powder or chili powder or various other spices, cumin or thyme or things, but it I'm probably not doing it the way a real chef would, so it they, they just dulls out the flavor and you don't taste that much when it just boils for and simmers for 45 minutes. So I, I don't often bother with that, but sometimes I'll, I'll put try some chili powder or something or curry in there or just the, the turmeric powder. So other vegetables for variety. There is burdock. Burdock is a long root that you find in the Asian stores. It's sometimes called gobo. And this is, it's an invasive plant, but it does grow all over the U.S. It looks like rhubarb almost. It's got like big triangular leaves and it, the stem is not as thick as rhubarb. It's kind of that, got that reddish thing. I used to go out and dig this root up myself when I lived in Philadelphia, but it's, it's a fair amount of work. And you don't get nice straight ones in the wild because it'll hit a rock and go crooked. 
and you can't just pull it up. You have to dig it all the way down. But burdock is a nice addition. I can use okra, maybe two okra pods chopped up. I'll use scallions or what are those, green onions, whatever they call them. Other, other things in the onion family chopped up and thrown in. Sometimes string beans with the, the end stems cut off. Maybe a handful of string beans. Asparagus, the same way, chop that up. Might use cauliflower. Sometimes I'll use those yucca roots that you get in the, in the Asian stores. They're, uh, it's, it's a nice starchy, you know, white on the inside. Take the skin off. There's a, there's a pith through the middle of it that I have to cut out. But uh, it's a good, good alternative to a uh, potato. And in the, on top, I always put the greens at the top, the, the kale. But sometimes I'll use collard greens instead of kale because collard greens last longer in the refrigerator, although the kale tastes better. And another variation is instead of using rice, I'll use barley, that pearl barley. And I got into using this because there's a concern that the rice, eating a whole lot of rice all the time, the, there's a tendency for arsenic to build up in the rice itself. And from what I've read, there, it, it doesn't matter if it's organic or what variety of rice it is, you, you get this arsenic buildup, which not a concern if you eat rice once in a while, but if you're eating it every single day like I am, it's something to think about. So I'll use barley instead on every other day or every two or three days just for variety. Other vegetables could be broccoli cut up. I can use that. Or a, a really nice squash instead of butternut or acorn is that... Uh, Kabuchi, I think it's called squash. It's the, the bigger, dark green one, and that has a very nice flavor to it. Sometimes I will buy a plantain, the, the banana family thing, and cut that up, a couple slices of that to, to put that in. The bananas, are, to me, are they're too sweet, but the plantains taste better. And did you know that you can eat the skin of a banana, or any, anything in the banana family, the skin is perfectly edible. You, you do want to wash it carefully if it's not organic because they put the pesticide on the outside of the banana. But the, the skin can be eaten. I think there's, I've heard of things you can do like fry it and it make sort of a bacon, fake bacon out of it or something like that. I haven't, haven't tried that myself. Other exotic things. I, I will often, when I can, get chestnuts, real American chestnuts. That I used to get them off of the tree in the in the fall, gather them up, fight the squirrels, <laughs> and uh, two chestnuts in with in them in there towards the bottom with the rice tastes very nice. You can buy chestnuts in the Asian markets. Usually there's it's a uh, chestnuts from China or, or Korea somewhere, and they're they're very large, but they, I find they don't taste nearly as good as real American chestnuts, but as as has been uh, well researched, the the American chestnut tree did not do very well from a couple, maybe a hundred years ago when the, a blight wiped it all out. So there's a, there's a, some of them left now, but they're few and far between. Or I could use water chestnuts, which is a whole different thing. It's not a nut per se, but water chestnuts. I used to get them in the can, but if you get the if you can find the fresh ones, they have the the, the husk, the skin still on them. Those are, are very nice. You cut them in half and put them in, and it gives a very nice flavor. I have used uh, cattails. This is, a, in this country anyway, a wild foraged food, but cattails, in, in the late spring, early summer, if you get the right part of the plant, um, that becomes a tasty treat. Uh, rhubarb, rhubarb itself, maybe a, like a half a stem of rhubarb cut up is a nice flavor. I've used, um, they're called in the store sometimes sun chokes. It's actually the Jerusalem artichoke is the, another name for it, but they, they, they have nothing to do with Jerusalem and they're not artichokes. It's a, it's a tuber thing. You can use it like a potato. I used to dig them up myself in the wild. You don't get them very large in the wild, but the, they, are, they have a very unique flavor. 
And sometimes, if I can find it, I will use fresh turmeric instead of the, the powdered spice stuff. But the actual, it looks like a like smaller garlic size. I'm sorry, ginger, ginger size, like a smaller ginger thing. They're more orangey. And cut that up, and that's, it tastes much better than the, than the powder. And it, it is turmeric is how it, it actually spells. Some people say turmeric, but it actually spelled with the R as the third letter, turmeric. And so if I have a whole variety of vegetables and constantly buying some and, and then some I've run out of and you know, get other ones. So you, you know you have enough vegetables making this recipe when you forget something. Um, and you have to remember the next day to use it. So that then, then you've got enough. If if I'm really low and I'm just using onions and potatoes to fill it out, and maybe some green on top with the rice and beans, but with with all the other extra stuff, that that's what keeps it keeps it uh, exciting from day to day. You can also use basmati rice. So it's a, a deluxe version of this would be brown basmati rice, which has a very nice fragrance to it, and instead of olive oil on the top. I'll use toasted sesame oil, and instead of uh, cheddar cheese, I may use Parmesan, but not, not grated Parmesan. Actually, the, the solid block of Parmesan, just take large shavings off of that on top. That's very nice. And I also have used cardamom seeds, and these are, it's like an Indian spice. The, the seed itself you can buy and then you break off the husk, and you, you can eat the husk as well. The flavor is all in the husk and the little seeds inside. And you can break that apart or grind it up a little bit and put that in. You, you can buy the powder, but the, the seeds themselves are, are more fresh. And that, that, I don't use it that much because that, that stuff's not real cheap, but it, it's, it's a nice flavor. And I will often buy some frozen vegetables, particularly frozen peas, and those are in the in the freezer in reserve. So when I'm all out of, say, the kale or collard greens on top, I'll use peas on top to give me some green in there. So that's more or less the dubside breakfast breakdown. And I, when I'm traveling and have enough time to buy the full stock of the ingredients, I sometimes will make this in the morning and make extra for the, whoever I'm staying with wants to try some. And I've had people say that they they uh, enjoyed it. I had some, somebody said I should make a a cookbook, and I said, well, I, it would only have one recipe in it because this is all I know how to make. The one difficulty I have when I'm traveling is that if I have the time to to get all the ingredients and try to make this, every stove is different when you want to go down to simmer. And you can put it on one out of ten, but not some stoves that you'll you'll it'll be after 45 minutes still be water in there and it's hardly cooked. And other ones it'll, it'll be burning. So I have to experiment a bit. Sometimes it takes two or three days to get the setting right. I suppose if I wanted to be really precise, I should get a infrared thermometer and take readings so I'd know exactly what it says. But I I just experiment, and if it takes a couple of days, that that's what happens. I have, on more than one occasion, run into a problem when I'm traveling somewhere and have all the ingredients for this and try to make it on a day when I'm scheduled to do instruction. And there's a whole uh, lineup for, say, you know, 8.30 or 9 o'clock, be ready in your gear, and we'll go to the water, and then at 10 o'clock, you know, the schedule's all set. So I've got it all calculated. I'll have to wake up this early. And have this much, you know, I have the 45 minutes to cook and then another half an hour to eat and then brush my teeth and get my gear on and everything. So it's all scheduled just just uh, precisely. And I will put it on to cook and go away to do yoga or whatever and come back and someone has inadvertently turned off the burner. And I don't know when they turned it off. It was at the beginning or towards the end. And... and so I'll, I might try to eat it or give it another five or ten minutes. It might still be totally uncooked. And, 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 and it just ruins the whole day because there's, there's not enough time to start over again because I'm not going to have another 45 minutes because i got to go teach a class and all that. Sometimes I feel I should, I should stand guard by the stove to keep that from happening. But it is, can be a problem sometimes. 
I just really do not appreciate when people mess with my breakfast. <laughs> now, I tell you all this just to satisfy anyone's curiosity about what I eat. But I am not trying to get anyone else to eat this. I'm not preaching diet. You can eat whatever you want. I feel that this breakfast is the best food in the world for me. You can eat whatever you want. I'm really not interested in hearing any criticism of what I eat or analysis of it. I don't feel I have to rationalize it to anyone. This is what I eat, and I don't need to justify it in any way. I spell all this out here so that in the future, anyone who asks me what I like to eat for breakfast, I can just tell them to listen to Dubcast number 46, and it's all there. If I haven't been able to give any advance notice, I'll be at some event and the morning they've got food laid out for the instructors and I'm looking at like bacon and eggs, no. Um, sausages, no thanks. Um, toast, well, I don't know. And maybe they got oatmeal, I'll have to make do with that. But trying to, trying to find a vegetable, you know, could I get a carrot or something? Or maybe if I'm really lucky, I'll find a slice of a tomato, but something about it. Vegetables for breakfast in the American diet are notably absent. I have been to some fancy restaurants when other people have paid for it and ate some interesting things, but overall, I would say that between a choice between me making my breakfast the way I like to make it and eating in any restaurant in the world, I'll take my breakfast any day. Thank you very much. Last year, I picked up the new CD from Nanook, my favorite band from Greenland, and this is called Inut Sinit Apu Sisluta, which that's the title track. It translates to getting our message out from within. And so the song I have here to do is called Namagitanak. And in this, on this CD, they're, they're translating... Um, not directly, but they're just giving giving you sort of the, the theme of what they're talking about, which I guess makes more sense because the word-for-word -word translation, you, you lose something of the meaning because the, there's no direct correlation between every Greenlandic word and every English word, so it gets a little confusing. So this song, Namagitalnek, they translate that as thankful. That, in my dictionary, is given as can mean either patience or frugality. So I guess when you combine those, you can come to the uh, idea of being thankful. Instead of translating word for word, they say, this song is about being thankful for what you already have. Collect memories and keep them inside forever. The memories will shape your life, so follow your heart and you will feel true love in your life. So here is my version of Namagitanak originally done by Nanook. Sun in a whooping gun, 
Well, as I've said in the past, these guys, Nanook, are the best thing that ever happened to Greenlandic music. And I did, this is the third time I've done one of their songs. So the first was on dubcast number 11, and that was Sivitopomi from their first CD. And in dubcast 22, I did a version of which was not on their first CD, but was uh, part of their material shortly after that. It's on some of their compilation CDs and their, their live CD. And you also might want to look at my article in the Kayak USA newsletter, Masik, the fall 2022 edition which is a, an overall view of Greenlandic music. And I've got picked out six CDs that are um, a good start. And I, I, when I talk about Nanook in there, I, I mentioned that uh, the, the two brothers who, who are the front men of the band, Frederick and Christian Elsner, they can both speak perfect English, yet every single syllable that they have recorded is in Greenlandic, their native language. And I give them a lot of respect for that. And as much success as they've had, I'm sure they've been told several times, you know, if you guys would just do some English material, you could widen your audience. And it sounds to me like they've just decided, no, we're not going to do that. They are creating their art on their own terms. Good for them. All the Nanook CDs and other merchandise are available at atlanticmusic.gl. I think there's a Nanook Facebook page also. Coming up in dubcast number 47, we will go to New Jersey, the southern part of New Jersey. And I'll tell you about my travels there way back in my early days of kayaking. 